Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we're going to explore Plato's great classic, The Republic. With me is Dr. Pierre Grimes, a specialist in classical philosophy, the founder of the American Philosophical Practitioners Association, founder of the Noetic Society, and author of a number of books, including Philosophical Midwifery. Also, Unblocking, which is a popular version of uh, philosophical midwifery, and it is also the basis of a computer program he wrote called Two Artemis, which is a, uh, an attempt to put the principles of philosophical midwifery into practice. Some of his other titles include The Pocket Pierre, Five Dialogues, and a forthcoming book on Jesus in, and Socrates, a dialogue in heaven. Welcome, Pierre. Pleasure. It's a pleasure to be with you once again. Yes. And to explore Plato's Republic is, is one of the great classics in, in the Western mm. canon. Uh, I think it would be included in everybody's list of, of the world's great mm. uh, literary works. And I think most people assume, as, as I mm. did, that Plato's Republic is primarily a, a, a book about a kind of utopian political system. Mm. You have a different perspective on yes. it. Yes. <laughs> you see, in book two of Plato's Republic, he spends a good part of book two exploring the idea of justice and injustice. And he says, you know, it is so difficult to understand justice and injustice because it, it's, it's small, it's, it's in man, and what we need is a larger model. He said, let's make an analogy with the state mm -hmm. so that we can see justice and injustice in the state for its analogy to the soul. Mm -hmm. So the entire book of the Republic is an analogy. The soul is to, is to justice as the state is to justice. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it's really a deep philosophical work, and it's only secondarily a political work. As a matter of fact, at the end of Book Nine, Socrates is being asked by Glaucon, Glaucon says, Socrates, do you think this will ever come about? And Socrates says, no, it never come about. Not only that, it doesn't matter whether it ever will come to be or not. It's only to be, it's only designed to be, as it were, a model in the heavens for us to contemplate. That's its true purpose. Mm -hmm. So therefore, it's secondary, it is a, a political model, but he repudiates it. He, matter of fact, has no interest in whether it would or would not exist in reality. Well, the analogy between the human soul and the state yes. is, is interesting. You know, many years ago I interviewed uh, Marvin Minsky, the uh, uh, a great specialist in uh, artificial intelligence. And if I recall correctly, he had just written a book called Mind as Society. Yes. And uh, there's a lot of thinking these days yes. that, the, that the human mind uh, is analogous mm -hmm. to a society in the sense that it's pluralistic. There are competing voices within mm -hmm. the human mind, competing motives, competing uh, impulses, uh, all striving for some kind of uh, spotlight in the center of consciousness. Plato seems to be suggesting, if I understand it, that that role, that central mm. role, belongs to what he mm. called the philosopher king. That's true. That's true. You know, what's interesting about Plato, and especially about the Republic, 
but you can see it most clearly in other dialogues like the Parmenides. Translators are not translating the word self that exists in Greek. It appears in over 400 times in the Parmenides, mm -hmm. and it's never translated as the self. Mm -hmm. One would look at the the idea of the Republic in a different way if it were translated and made visible that it's the whole dialogue is about the nature of the self. You know, I saw your recent essay on that very point. I think you titled it The Betrayal of Philosophy. Oh, yes, yes. That, 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 that for the whole field of philosophy for generations and for centuries to be commenting on Plato without understanding the, uh, his use of such a concept as the self is fundamental. Uh -huh. Nothing more fundamental. Yeah. And it, it certainly suggests a, a, a terrible uh, gap in, in our thinking, or more than our thinking, maybe it's, it's, it's a weakness in our soul. Well, we see, we're influenced, our education is influenced by people who were essentially uh, solipsists, David Hume, Barclay, Immanuel Kant. Let's define that term oh, oh. for our viewers who may not understand what a solipsist All is. Right. The assumption that everything we experience, we really experience inside in our own mind. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we never encounter a reality. It is all in our mind, and therefore, all, everything is subjective. Yeah. See, when David Hume announced that as a central thesis in his, his work on human understanding, he, he recognizes the weakness in his system. Mm -hmm. He even describes it. He says, by the way, I don't want you to ask one question. Do not ask, is there any way to determine whether there is any resemblance between what I experience in my mind and the external world? He says, you can't answer that. Oh. If you can't answer it, that means, sir, you have a very foolish system. You're locked into yourself and you have no reality. Yeah. But that's David Hume. Oh, I, but the whole scientific endeavor is about reconciling uh, what is real, objective, measurable, empirical. Well, you see, that's the effort of, of your, that is central to Europe. Mm -hmm. The empirical method, absolutely yep. right. The only trouble with that, does it, is it in principle solipsistic? Mm. Because the work we're now talking about, the Republic, yes. is that there is a reality. It is experiential. Mm -hmm. One can encounter it. Yeah. One can encounter an experience, a what we sometimes called enlightenment. Mm -hmm. He talks about two kinds of enlightenment in the Republic. He calls being the most brilliant light of being. That's what he calls being. Mm -hmm. That's the divine illumination. Yeah. Divine illumination. Mm -hmm. That's called the idea of the good. Mm -hmm. Because the word idea is a Greek word. It's a Greek word. Idea. 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 What does it mean? To behold. If you behold the good, that's an experience. Yes. It's not the good, because the good is beyond all experience. And therefore, Plato's Republic is to try to push the relationship between these two fundamental highest terms, mm -hmm. most brilliant light of being and the good. Well, if I understand Plato, one of, one of the important primary concepts is, is the notion that there is this platonic world, a world of perfect forms, a world of perfect truth, goodness, and beauty. Mm. To, to which we can never attain, but to which we should always strive. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you don't mind. Yeah. Okay, look. The idea that Plato has the notion of forms mm -hmm. is a result of a translation of Jowett. Jowett translates the word idea as forms, mm -hmm. and therefore everybody's talking about Plato's forms. Yeah. No, 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 no. In the experience of divine illumination, 
different people can experience and say, that is the most beautiful thing. That's beauty in itself. Others can see the same experience and say, oh, I detect in that experience mind itself, knowing itself. Mm -hmm. Plato in the symposium talks about beauty itself and he says, that's reality. By the way, in the Greek, it's truth. Mm -hmm. right? That's a moment where you see what is true or the truth. Mm -hmm. So all of these so-called ideas of forms are nothing other than what can be inferred from that experience. Mm. Beauty, justice, goodness, truth, ultimate reality. They're all just different aspects and ways of talking about divine illumination, which is, is, is and has been experienced by many people in our age since LSD came along. Let me ask you this, though. I want to push you a little yes, bit, yes. because my understanding is, no, first of all, that mathematicians and uh, geometrists in mm. particular favor Plato. And, and that, if, if I recall correctly, on the gates to Plato's academy, it, it was inscribed something to the effect of, let mm. none enter who don't understand geometry. Yes. So geometry was important to Plato. Because insight is important to philosophy. Mm -hmm. There is no study of geometry that is not dependent upon insight. Yep. When you get the final solution to any proposition, the QED, that's a moment of insight brought about by a rational understanding. Starts with definitions. You make divisions. You then have a demonstration. Then you make an analysis. That's the conclusion. It's a completely rational system, but it ends always with insight. Mm -hmm. The cultivation of insight is by geometry. Uh -huh. Okay. Now, in the Republic, there's the famous allegory of the cave. Oh, great. Which is, is really, I think it's kind of central. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you could uh, elaborate on it. Well, if you work on the assumption that Plato, central to Plato's thought, and certainly it is true in other dialogues like the time is, analogy is central, mean analogy is central, four-term analogies are central. Therefore, the question is, to what is the allegory a cave analogous to? So now we have to ask, is it possible to line up all of the terms in the allegory of the cave and find their equivalents or their analogs? Now, I think some of our viewers may not be familiar oh. with, with that allegory. So could you summarize it briefly? Yes. Uh, it comes out of an analogy. The analogy is, as the sun is to its light, so the good is to divine luminosity. Glaucon has a great deal of trouble with this, and he wants to understand it. Socrates says, you're not going to understand it unless I talk to you about four ideas, image thinking, belief, understanding, and knowing. And he shows in his analogy, this is sometimes called the divided line. And for each of those, each one has its own special object, object of study. And then Glaucon says, I'm having trouble with this. And Socrates says, that's because you don't understand analogies. Go home and do your work. But let me show you what it applies to. That's the allegory of the cave. Mm -hmm. right. The allegory of the cave starts with a great opening. Why is there a big opening in the cave is one of the central questions. See, for every th idea in this story of the allegory of the cave, there should be some reason why it exists. Mm -hmm. So in the allegory of the cave, we find people that are chained. They've been chained there their whole lives. Even their neck is chained, so they cannot turn left or right, but they only can focus on the wall of the cave. Behind them at a distance, which of course they can never see since they cannot turn their heads about, is a fire. And it throws a light out. 
and it is a result of that fire. Between the fire and the people watching the wall of the cave, there is a high parapet, and among which uh, men walk back and forth carrying objects on their head. Mm -hmm. And they talk to one another, and that produces the echoes which the men in the cave think are the, are the shadows of the wall speaking. Mm -hmm. And the objects on their head cast figures on the wall of the cave, and they take that to be reality. Mm -hmm. That's their reality. And Socrates says, you know, you have to have someone go down to the cave and drag that person up, free him of these chains, and force him to turn around and look at what is going on so he can see that the fire is producing the shadows and the voices that the, these carriers of these figures are saying are the echoes that you take to be reality. He said, you have to stand this man up and force him to see this. Yeah. He said, They'll rush back. They're afraid, they'll rush back. They don't want to believe that that's the truth. Mm -hmm. So you have to drag them up the steep ascent into the upper world. Once in the upper world, there's an, the real world. And the first episode is a dark night where he can then see through, this, through the moonlight and the stars, the objects. And then later, then he then is able to see the sun in its true place. Mm -hmm. And therefore, he can then experience the nature of reality. Mm -hmm. Now, for each one of these things, there should be something that is similar. Yeah. Right. Same thing as Jesus in the, uh, in the parables. Every parable should have its parallel, because every parable should be reduced to an allegory. Right? And an allegory is, in essence, an analogy. Mm -hmm. So it means that the people who are listening, if they only can understand what these parables represent, they have the meaning and they walk away with understanding. Yeah. The only trouble is, and uh, for Jesus, the key terms to the terms are kept secret. Oh. And he only, saw, he only tells those to his inner circle. Mm -hmm. But in an analogy in Plato, every term is fixed and every term can be found as in its parallel so that it can be completely understood. Mm -hmm. So now the question of the allegory of the cave is, what are the voice? Why does he have the voices, and why does he have the carriers carrying the objects on their head? Yeah. Well, in order to understand that, you have to find the language he uses to describe those images, and find them elsewhere in the text to find their proper analogous product. Mm -hmm. He says, you know what? He said, we must take a look at the fact that uh, there are certain types of men, and for each type of man, there's a political constitution. Mm -hmm. Therefore, there's democracy because they're democratic men. There's tyranny because they're tyrannical men. There's allegory because they're allegorical men, right? And, and there's aristocracy, there are the aristocratic men. He said, by the way, you have to understand that they are the products of families the dynamics of the family produces these people. Mm -hmm. By the way, that's the pathologos. The pathologos, we better define that right. term. Uh, <laughs> you and I understand it, but our viewers have just heard it for the first time, and it's crucial to mm -hmm. your own philosophy. The question in, in, the, in the explanation in Plato's Republic is he understands thoroughly that the family produces their own logos, their own way of being, and that and each family demands a loyalty to it, but he never has the origin to it mm. because he didn't understand Homer's Iliad. Uh -huh. <laughs> but the, each one of those family constellations are like those people walking back and forth with objects on their head. They represent what the teachings are from each of these families. Mm -hmm. And therefore, each of these carriers, they're the same number of people mm -hmm. carrying as there are types of governments. And they show through the shadows on the walls of the cave, which men take to be real. They hear these men talking, and that's what they take to be real. Those voices are the voices that represent the family teachings. So the family teachings, or one might say the, even the tribal teachings, are like a burden. Brr, heavy, yeah. powerful, yeah. loyalty is demanded. Mm -hmm. Yes? Mm -hmm. 
Yes, an exile, even death, might be the price of violating mm -hmm. that, that loyalty. Mm -hmm. Now, the part of the allegory of the cave that has always fascinated me is when the person returns back yes. to the cave. Yes, that lovely? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Well, he, he, he comes back to let everybody know about, you know, there's a real reality outside and it's light and, and uh, it's a whole different world and he is shunned. Yes. He says, see, the great thing about it, he said, what does he gain? He gains, he has the ability now to see better than a thousand eyes see, because he knows what the beliefs are and what they are beliefs of. Mm -hmm. That's the key. Yeah. Right? It's not enough to know that you believe something. What do they represent and how did you come to, to accept them? Mm -hmm. And that's what the man coming back down the cave knows, and therefore he knows exactly what the images are and what they represent. By the way, it's dangerous for him sometimes because the people might get upset with mm -hmm. that kind of knowing and mm -hmm. put him to death, which is what happened. Yeah. Yes. Uh, see, uh, Plato is is uh, Plato's Republic has one feature which is extremely important. That is, the whole thing is a, a structured analogy from beginning to end, even from the very beginning, the opening part, book one. Why, does, why is Socrates going down to the Piraeus? He's going with Glaucon. Why is, why is there that episode? Because when he goes down to the, uh, to the Piraeus, he's going to watch a religious celebration. Mm -hmm. And he's on his way back and he's held and forced to come to stay in the Piraeus. Uh oh, that was an injustice. Yeah. So the very first page of the Republic represents an, a model for the entire Republic. Mm -hmm. Because then Socrates then is forced to go to the House of Cephalus, which happens to be the parents of the of the as we could call them the kidnappers. Mm -hmm. And he then engages them in dialogue for the rest of the night, and that allows them to free him, and he goes back to Athens. I see. That's the Republic. So when you refer to Piraeus, that's the port city yes. adjacent to Athens. Yes, yes and I that's the allegory of the cave. That's uh -huh. the cave. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell me now uh, uh, more about the role of the philosopher king. Oh, wow. Well, in the ninth book, which very, is a very important part. He says, the only way you can get knowledge of yourself is through dreams. Because through dreams you're able to get insights into your present, your past, and in your future. Mm -hmm. Only there he talks about the need for insights through dreams. Plato will often, in every dialogue, he often takes a central idea and mentions it once, doesn't elaborate on it, but it plays a key role within the work itself. So therefore, in the Republic, here's this quest for deep understanding. Where do you get it and how do you get it? It's through dreams. And that's in the ninth book, mm. from one paragraph. Oh. Is that remarkable? It is. That's, that's very <laughs> remarkable. But are you saying that the, the, these uh, dream watchers are, are the philosopher kings? Yes. Okay. That's the only way you can get personal information. But you see, uh, what's interesting about Greek culture is the role of dreams. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, I've been been puzzled why people don't talk about the role of dreams in Greek culture. Now there's one work, Cyrenius, that was in the second century, and he was a Platonist and he knew the role of dreams and he said, you know, I don't like talking about dreams. Everybody knows about dreams, but I'm going to talk about them. It's not interesting. Everybody knows about dreams, but no one talks about them. <laughs> <laughs> but in the ancient world, I, I'm under the impression that dreams were regarded practically as equivalent to waking experience. Oh, yes. No mm -hmm. physician ever treated a patient without first studying their dreams. Mm -hmm. That was their method of, of a d diagnosis, a key part of diagnosis. 
Absolutely. And uh, that one other one other th interesting thing about Plays Republic is that um, you have to do the weaving to get to the meaning. Mm -hmm. Like all through the Platonic world and Platonic literatures, there's the struggle between pleasure and pain. Mm. What's the problem? Man is caught in pleasures. That's the problem, and he tries to escape escape pain. Yep. And man's real problem is that he gets caught up in pleasures, and that's ruinous, and it ruins the soul. No. When he talks about the four virtues, and he talks about temperance, that's a very that's a word which is curious because it presupposes this other word, courage, and that's one of the key virtues. What does he mean by courage? He says, you know, courage is being able to know what is most dangerous to the soul and what is not. That's courage. Oh. He said, because unless you know that, how can you live your life? Mm -hmm. But that's not enough. He says, you know what? He says, both gods and men hate one thing, to have a false, a false idea of the nature of reality in your soul. Mm -hmm. He said, that's the worst thing of all. Therefore, pleasure, the problem with pleasure is that in pleasure you may see that as a reality and assume that is your highest reality and therefore you will become addicted to your pleasure. There are even philosophies based on yeah. exactly that. Yeah. But he's now saying, you see, therefore the, the antidote mm -hmm. is courage. Therefore you should be able to know the nature of reality and hold to the nature of reality and any pleasure you experience which is the same thing in the Bhagavad Gita. And uh, I know you're also a Buddhist scholar. Yes. You get that idea in Buddhism as well, yes. don't you? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. But it never is as clear as it is in Plato. Mm -hmm. Well, once again, Pierre Grimes, uh, this is, <laughs> has been a delight and, and a very illuminating time. I, uh, I love these conversations. It's my pleasure, I assure you, doubly over. Thank you for being with me. My pleasure. And thank you thank for you. being with us.